There are few issues which incite so much passion in so many people than the topic of education. You will hardly talk to anyone who doesn't feel that there are major flaws in the education system, especially in the United States. Thousands of mobilizations have tried to reform certain policies within the system, but the self-directed learning movement strikes at the heart of that system and seeks its complete overthrow and replacement with something entirely new. Probably the most radical wing of the self-directed learning movement is the current advocating for total, direct, participatory democracy of students and staff. This is the current that I will spend most of this video focusing on. I mainly seek to talk to my fellow advocates of democratic free schools, Sudbury schools, agile learning centers, and unschooling, and bring forth, out of a deep love for the movement, what I think is a much needed critique of its current trajectory. The main thrust of my critique is this. How can we spend so much effort building free, empowered, radically democratic, and communal personalities in our schools, and then send the kids out into a broader society that is so profoundly unfree, disempowering, hierarchical, and atomized? In other words, the democratic free school movement far too often fails to take our ideas to their radical conclusion. We build little utopias for our kids and then retreat into insularity, failing to take on the root causes that incentivize such an overbearing school system in the first place. I hope that this self-criticism session can spark an internal conversation about what kind of world we want our democratic schools to feed into. If I succeed in my argument, you will walk away from this with the realization that truly self-directed schools require us to build and fight for self-directed communities. What are democratic free schools? Before we dive deeper, let me get a few disclaimers out of the way. Democratic free schools are just one section of the big tent self-directed learning movement. And I am greatly inspired and informed by contributions from the entire vast spectrum of the movement. But I wanted to hone in on this particular type of school because it is the one I'm most familiar with. I think there are elements of democratic schools that people in every part of the self-directed movement can get behind, so I hope that those who advocate for different models within the movement can still gain a lot from this video. I don't want to spend too much time explaining every nook and cranny of the democratic free school model, because there are many great videos that do just that, and because this video is most targeted to those already within this movement. I do, however, plan to make a video that argues why proponents of broader societal autonomy, grassroots democracy, and fellow travelers should embrace self-directed education and incorporate it more into their arguments and practical action. That video will be aimed towards people who have never heard of such schools. For now, let me try to give a short introduction by breaking democratic free schooling down into its most essential components. For those who are familiar with the model, feel free to skip ahead. The starting premise behind the democratic free school is essentially that kids are naturally eager learners, creative, and curious people who, given the freedom and autonomy to make the decisions that affect them and explore their passions to the fullest, will continue on a path of a lifelong embrace of learning. Traditional schools embrace uniformity, authority, and rigorous standards and do little but crush that natural curiosity and passion in youth. Democratic free schools seek to overturn that with a few key pillars direct democracy and shared power in community, leadership through guidance and not authority, an embrace of play, and full freedom to explore one's individual passions and desires. A quick look at each pillar in turn. 1. Direct democracy and shared power in community. At a democratic school, the rulebook usually starts with a blank slate and becomes filled, added to, subtracted from, and modified over time through the flexible, directly democratic school meeting, in which all students and staff have a direct say in all decisions that affect them and govern the school. This could mean anything from the physical design of the building, the admissions policy, and how funds are raised and spent, to the hiring and firing of staff, or how transgressions of the mutually agreed upon rules should be handled. Many democratic free schools strive for consensus decisions instead of a rule by majority. The middle person of the decision-making process is cut out. There are no principals or school boards imposing rules from above. Contrary to what one might think, 
In my experience, this actually leads to less chaos and kids more likely to follow the rules because they themselves participated in the proposing of rules, debating them, and finally voting on them. It follows that they are responsible for holding each other and the staff accountable to the rules. So the kids actually feel like they have more ownership in their education and want to be there more. If you don't believe me, find me any other type of school where the kids not only have the power to vote to, but did vote to go to school during the summer. That actually happened at a democratic free school I worked at. True, healthy community necessitates shared power and participation by everyone, instead of decisions and the ability to act being imposed and monopolized from above. The conditions most conducive to friendship are true equality and power. A community where decision-making power is decentralized widely to everyone means that people depend on close, friendly relationships with their peers, as that is the environment most suitable to building consensus. With this constant need to cooperate, we have an environment where cliquish behavior is not rewarded. In my experiences, democratic free schools incubate a sense that everyone in the school is a potential playmate, learning partner, or supporter of the next great idea you might bring to the table. This is a far cry from the highly competitive environments incubated by AP classes and standardized tests where your classmates are often seen as potential threats to one's individual achievement, from whom knowledge is to be guarded at all costs. The more students are pit against each other, the more likely for bullying and other antisocial behavior. I don't want to minimize the possibility that bullying can and does happen in free schools as in any environment, but I would argue that a strong democratic and cooperative culture would make them far less susceptible. Those schools at the forefront of this emphasis on direct democracy uphold the democratic ethos across the board. By this, I mean not only are the relations between staff and students thoroughly democratic, but also the relations among staff. Staff have their own meetings to democratically decide on all aspects of the school that only affect them, namely their own hours and pay. Some even leave this aspect of school also subject to the whole school meeting so that students really do have full say on the school budget. The important message here is that all school founders should seriously consider what message it sends to students to say the whole school is democratically run, while not modeling democracy among ourselves as staff. Even in environments where youth and adults share power equally, kids do look up to adults as mentors, and to have hierarchical relations among staff could send the message that the democracy we advocate is a sham or that real, radical democracy is just something that works as kids, but then we have to grow out of it and face the real world of stratification and power imbalances. There is a model for democratically run businesses outside of the free school movement. Worker-owned cooperatives running through workers' self-management have existed as long as people have made decisions about economic life or carried out tasks together. This has always been a current running through society even as the hierarchical business models we know so well today became dominant. If we want to be at the forefront of democratic practice, then I think it is important that we show our commitment to these beliefs by democratizing power in our schools as workplaces and not just as learning environments. Many schools are already doing just that, or started under worker self-management in the first place. There is nothing to stop school founders of existing schools who see themselves as employers to take that small extra step and further decentralize power and responsibility among the rest of the staff. 2. Leadership through guidance and not authority A strong egalitarian community is never without leaders. Equality recognizes that each individual has unique skills and passions to bring to the whole, but places no individual with unique skills above the rest. Democratic free schools allow for every student and staff member to be a leader when they are sharing their gifts with others, but it is important that leadership is not turned into a permanent position of authority. In democratic schools, teaching is not something that is limited to adults. 3. Play Play is a natural and beneficial human activity and should never be limited to the confines of recess. Free play is so crucial for developing kids' sense of cooperation, consent, communal responsibility, as well as their imagination. 
Unlike in traditional schooling, where play is seen as something separate from business and as something that should mostly be done at home, democratic schools put little to no limits on how often kids can play or what kind of play they do. The adults don't try to steer kids towards productive or useful play. That's not for us to judge. The more adults intervene with play, the more they limit children's creativity. Democratic free schools usually encourage adults to be quiet observers of play, unless invited to join in by the kids. Play teaches us how to check in with one another, to make sure everyone is still having fun, to be attuned to each other's needs and wishes, to build teamwork skills, and encourages equality. Everyone will just quit playing if one person gets to be the king of the treehouse all the time. 4. Full freedom to explore one's individual passions and desires. A democratic free school is a place of constant learning, even without a set curriculum. Students are never held to some minimum essential knowledge they must obtain. They don't take tests, get graded on their work, or go home with homework. Classes are often organized based on specific interests of students or staff, and can be taught by staff or students, but none of them are required. A student is free to go their whole time in the school without attending a single organized class. At the heart of the concept is total freedom for anyone in the school to explore their passions or desires or even passing interests to the fullest extent they care to. Staff are there to help students find the resources they need, if asked, to continue on whatever path or paths the child decides to venture down. This could mean helping them find books, films, or websites related to an interest, say, adobe housing, connecting them with experts, say, a traditional builder of adobe houses who can pass on that knowledge, or helping them approach that interest hands-on, attempting to build an adobe house with the kid. In this way, a staff member is more often to fill a mentor role than that of an instructor. Unlike traditional schooling, kids in democratic schools aren't forced to learn anything they don't want to. And there are no prejudged standards for what acceptable knowledge or activities are. Those decisions are truly in the hands of the individual student and the broader community through the school meeting. These are in my mind the defining features of this model. This is a lot to take in and very hard for most people to imagine because it is a world away from conventional schooling with all its assessments, statistics, and measurements. If you want to see it in action, my first recommendation is that you visit your local democratic school, Sudbury, or related school. Other than that, I highly recommend the documentary School Circles, which you can rent or buy off of Vimeo, and the feature-length film Summer Hill that you can find free on YouTube under the title Best Freedom Movie Ever. A friend of mine said the latter film felt a little too after school specially for him, and I can see what he means, but I love it. The trap of hyper individualism and the need for a social turn. Before I get into the critiques, I have to be upfront and say that I can't think of a more fulfilling, holistically beneficial environment that I've experienced in my own life than a democratic free school. Even as staff, I feel more of a sense of autonomy there than any other workplace I've ever been, by a long shot. My opinions matter, and I care deeply about the work I do because not only do I see it affecting students' lives in positive ways like most teachers, but I know that I am empowered to shape and nurture the very design of the school on a daily basis. I get to watch kids find their voice, feel valued and respected as fully functioning human beings, and explore their passions to the fullest extent. I get to exist within a true community, a space of shared survival of different ages that takes care of each other. We can sometimes get so caught up in the day to day that we forget the harsh realities of the world outside of the school. A common conversation we have in the school comes from the discrepancies that sometimes happen between school life and home life. Just how helpful is empowering kids at school when they go home to hovering or even dictatorial parents? We talk a lot about how to cooperate with the parents of each child to make sure the students return home to a household that isn't overbearing and stimulates and allows the same kind of urges for freedom as the school does. As hard as that work is, it isn't enough to safeguard the democratic personalities that democratic free schools try our hardest to encourage. 
If we want to develop a freedom-loving personality, then we need to build a world outside of school and the home that encourages the same freedom and community support. This is where I think we often fall short. In our important focus on the individual, we can sometimes neglect the broader community and the world at large. Despite most of the states of the world embracing the term democracy, if democracy is supposed to be decisions made by the people for the people, it is clear that most of us get very little say in the actual decisions that run our lives. The kind of democracy we participate in at democratic schools, where we propose, debate, and vote for or even come to consensus on every single decision without intermediaries, is infinitely more empowering than the choices we have outside of it between a few pre-selected elite political candidates every two or four years or which type of nefariously produced chocolate bar we spend our money on. Spend any length of time in a democratic school meeting and then go to work, stroll around your neighborhood, or visit a city council meeting and you will see the unbelievably obvious differences in autonomy you have within the first environment compared to the other three. In democratic schools, power becomes a collective process in which everyone takes part in shaping their own life and shaping the community around them. Outside of the school, we are always forced to live according to someone else's plan, be they bureaucrats, HOA, politicians, bosses, city planners. Our environment becomes something that happens to us, something imposed on us, rather than something we actively shape. Then those same people have the audacity to tell us, that's just the way the world works, as if our current state of affairs are natural and unchangeable. The microcosm of democratic free school communities proves them wrong. But democratic schools give students tools and freedom which are suppressed in the outside world. We prepare them to participate directly in democracy, but they come out into a world where they are governed, bossed, surveilled, judged, punished, and held subject to a vast range of decisions that they never had a say on, and often that no one even alive today ever had a say on. We empower them to be the subjects of their own destiny, but they leave our walls into a world that treats them like objects to be marketed to. We prepare them to take ownership over their lives, and then send them into a world where the most important decisions affecting them are outsourced to those that seek to manage them. Kids grow up as part of a strong community that shares resources and power with one another and then come into an isolated, tumultuous world where fewer and fewer of us even know the person that lives next door. It is not a failing of the democratic school that it is not churning out loyal followers of power. It is rather a challenge to us. How can we navigate in a world that constantly imposes hierarchies contrary to the values we have cultivated in our schools? We should never accept the argument that what is will be, which is, as Murray Bookchin said, the acid that corrodes all visionary thinking. We should never give in and line up our schools with students that would be a good fit, going with the flow in the disempowering world that has been built. We should not turn inward and let that world co-opt and defang our schools. We should turn outward and try to shape the world to the standards of freedom that we have built together in our democratic free schools. The democratic free school is not enough. It is our responsibility, those who have experience in these forms of community self-direction, to build democratic, free communities for our kids to feed into.